Welcome back to this series on topology. In today's video, we'll be looking at the concept of homeomorphism, which gives us a way to say when two spaces are the same from the perspective of topology. You can find a link to the playlist containing the rest of the videos in this series by clicking on the info thing that should appear right now. Let's get started. If we have topological spaces x and y, we say that a continuous function, which I'll call phi between them is a homeomorphism if it has a continuous inverse. Remember that we defined continuity in terms of open sets. So we said that a function from x to y is continuous if every open set in the space y has an open preimage in x under that function. Now to go from a continuous function to a homeomorphism, we need two additional uh, constraints. The first one is that the function has to have an inverse. And second, that inverse also needs to be continuous. Schematically, if we have our space x and our space y, then we can go in a continuous manner from x to y using uh, the function phi. And also we can go in a continuous manner back again using the function phi inverse. And the fact that these functions are inverse to another means that if we have any point in the space x and we take phi to y and look at the image under uh, phi of this point, and then we take phi inverse uh, back again, then we land uh, back exactly at the same point. So in this case, this is phi inverse of phi of this point, which is just equal to the original point. Similarly, if we start in y, so we have this pink point and take phi inverse, then we have its image phi inverse of this point in x. And if we then take uh, phi back again, then we have the point phi of phi inverse of that point, and that is equal to the original point. More succinctly, uh, we have that phi inverse after phi is just the identity on x, and phi after phi inverse is the identity on y. This is just what it means for uh, a function to have an inverse. But because we're talking about topological spaces here, we also want both of these functions to be continuous. Okay, in the case where we have two spaces x and y that have a homeomorphism between them, in that case, uh, we say that the spaces are homeomorphic and we write x uh, isomorphic to y with this isomorphism symbol. As a warning, there's uh, not really one uh, standard convention for writing the symbol for homeomorphic spaces. So some authors will use this uh, double, double wavy lines uh, to mean that two spaces are homeomorphic and there's even other symbols that are used. But I will stick to uh, this equal sign with the tilde on top um, because for me that's the the standard symbol for isomorphism. And in fact, a homeomorphism is an isomorphism in the category of topological spaces. Also note here that in the way we talk about X and Y being homeomorphic, uh, there isn't a direction uh, to this. So in, in the definition of a homeomorphism, we have uh, a function that goes from X to Y, which is the homeomorphism. But now we're just talking about spaces being homeomorphic. And the reason this is okay is because being homeomorphic is actually an equivalence relation. So if we have a homeomorphism from x to y, then also we have a homeomorphism from y to x, just given by the inverse function. Moreover, any space is homeomorphic to itself by the identity function, which uh, we saw last time is continuous. And finally, if, uh, well, x is homeomorphic to y, and y is homeomorphic to another space, z, then x is also homeomorphic to z. So being homeomorphic is a transitive property as well. And this just follows by composing the homeomorphism we have from x to y with the homeomorphism we have from y to z. All right, so far so good. Now you might be used to the definition for isomorphisms between uh, other mathematical objects, for example, vector spaces and groups. And in that case, uh, the definition one usually gives is a bit different from what we see here. So in the case of vector spaces, an isomorphism of vector spaces is just a linear map that is bijective. So a linear map that has an inverse as a function. 
And similarly, one has that an isomorphism of groups is just a group homomorphism that has an inverse as a function. So in the case of uh, these algebraic objects such as vector spaces and groups, we don't have to check that the inverse is also a homomorphism or a linear map respectively. However, in the case of topological spaces, we have to impose this condition that the inverse also needs to be continuous. This is because there's examples of continuous functions that are bijective and hence have an inverse as a function, but whose inverse is no longer continuous. I put an example of such a function in an appendix to this video, which you can find by clicking on the info thing, uh, which should appear right now. Turned out that the example was rather long, so I put it in a separate video since it's not essential for the mainline narrative. Let's think a bit more about what it means to have a homeomorphism between two topological spaces. I said at the beginning of this video that homeomorphic spaces are basically the same from the point of view of topology. One reason for this should be clear directly from their definition, namely if we have spaces x and y, and we have this homeomorphism phi between them, then we can always go back and forth between x and y in a continuous manner and end up where we started. So suppose that I know some property about y. And further suppose that this property is defined in terms of the open sets of y. Now if I want to establish the same property for x, then I can look at the corresponding object in x, I can transport it using phi, and then I know that this property holds or doesn't hold in y. Now having established if the property holds or not for the image under phi, I can transport this image back to x in a continuous manner, and what I get is the same thing as the thing I started with in x. And the fact that this property is just defined in terms of open sets uh, means that it will be preserved by transporting it along the continuous phi and phi inverses. So in this way, if I've established some property for the image of the red set under phi, and I transport it back along phi inverse, then I've also established it um, in x. This is maybe a bit abstract, so let's do a concrete example. Say I have some, uh, just some point in x, and I want to know if it's a limit point of the red set. Now, let's say I don't know much about the topology on x, but I know a lot about the topology on y. So I can just transport this yellow point using phi, and the, re the, the red subset also using phi to y, and now say I can determine if this is a limit point or not. So let's assume uh, in this case that this image under phi of the yellow point is not a limit point of the red set. And now I've established also, because we have this homeomorphism, that the original yellow point is not a, a limit point of the original red set. Thus having this uh, homeomorphism allows us to transport problems from one space to another and we can do so without losing any information. So from that point of view, the spaces are essentially the same. Now the proposition that we're gonna look at now says something similar, namely that if we have two topological spaces, x1 and x2, that have topologies t1 and t2 respectively, and we have uh, some bijective function between them, then this function is a homeomorphism precisely when the following condition is fulfilled. And the condition states that a subset u is open in the space x1 if and only if its image is open in the space x2. In other words, the proposition is saying that a bijective function between two topological spaces is a homeomorphism if and only if it induces a one-to-one -one correspondence between the open sets of the first space and the open sets of the second space. Hence, if we have two homeomorphic spaces, then the topologies on those spaces are essentially the same, well, in the sense that they contain the same open sets up to translation by this function. For the proof of this, I'm gonna call this condition star, 
For this, we need to prove two directions. So in general, we assume that we have some bijective function f from x1 to x2. And now for the first direction, we assume that f is a homeomorphism. And we have to show that the condition star holds. For this, I again have to show two directions. So the first direction of star is assume that u is open in the topology on the space x1. Now, in that case, we have that f of u is equal to, well, it's the pre-image under the inverse function of u. This is just another way of looking at what the image under f is. If we have our space x1 and x2, and we have some subset u of x1, then we have its image f of u in x2. Now, because f is bijective, we can also look at the inverse function, which will map the subset f of u to u, because f inverse of f of u is just equal to the original subset u. Therefore, the inverse image of this subset u under the inverse function f inverse is just f of u. Okay, so what does this get us? Well, we know that u is open. That's what we assumed. It's in the topology of the space x1. And now we also know that f inverse is continuous. This is because f is a homeomorphism, so in particular it has an inverse which is continuous. Therefore, f inverse has the property that the preimage of open sets under f inverse are also open, which means that this entire thing here is open, and, well, this is equal to the image of u under f, so this has to be open, and that shows the first direction of this implication we need for the condition star. Now, for the other direction, we assume that f of u is open in the space x2, so that f of u is an element of the topology of x2. Now we need to show that u is an open set in x1. We say that u is the same thing as taking the preimage under f of f of u. And by hypothesis, f of u is open, and we also know that f is a continuous function. Hence, the preimage of this open set under f is again open, so this entire thing is open, which means that u is open. And this is exactly what we wanted to show. Great, so that shows the direction left to right um, of the proposition. Now let's turn to the other direction in which we suppose that star holds for our bijective function f. And now what we want to show is that f is in fact a homeomorphism. Now we already know that f is bijective, so the things we need to check is that f is continuous, and also that its inverse is continuous. So let's divide that into two claims. f is continuous. Well, for this we have to take some open subset, which is open in x2, so it's part of the topology t2. And now we need to show that the preimage under um, f is open in x1. But now v is equal to f of f inverse of v, and this subset f inverse of v is some subset u of x1. The reason we can rewrite v in this way is because f and f inverse are inverse to one another. And now we're just noticing that, well, the image of v under the inverse function is going to be a subset u in x1. But we don't know in principle yet if u is open or not. 
However, because of condition star, we know that u is in fact open in x1. Why is this? Well, here on the left-hand side, we have essentially f of u, and we know that this is equal to v, which is in uh, the topology of the space x2. And now condition star is saying that, well, if some f of u is in t2, then by going to the left, then also u is in t1, which means it's open in x1. So in fact, this is open in x1. Now for continuity, we're interested in the pre-image of v under f. And so the pre-image, so f inverse of v, is equal, if we write it in a more complicated way, to f inverse of f of f inverse of v. But now we called this f inverse of v, we called it u. And if we rewrite this, we get f inverse of f of u. And f inverse of f is just the identity, so this is equal to u. Now we know that u is open, and therefore also this f inverse of v is open because these two sets are equal. Hence, in summary, we've shown that f is continuous, which means that the preimage of an open set in x2 under f is also open in x1. Okay, now as last thing, we also need to check that f inverse is continuous. So now f inverse is a function from x2 to x1. So we need to take some u in t1, so an open set of x1, and we need to show that the preimage under f inverse is open in x2. So we're interested in the preimage under f inverse of this set u. But this is just f of u. It's the same argument we used uh, in previously in the proof. And now we know that u is in t1. So by star, this implies that also f of u is in fact in t2. That is, f of u is an open set in x2. But now because we have this equality, this means that this preimage is also open, and hence f inverse is continuous. So in total, we've shown that if the condition star holds, then for our bijective function f, we have that it's also a homeomorphism. And with that, we've completed the proof. As you can see, the proof of this is just juggling these f's and f inverses, and using the fact that the pre-image under f of some set is just the image of the inverse function of that same set. If this seemed in any way confusing, I encourage you to write it out for yourself and basically just stare at some of these equalities until you can convince yourself that they in fact hold. And then basically it's just, as you've seen, saying that certain sets are open and then equating them to different ways of writing those same sets. In any case, this proposition is nice because it says that if we have a homeomorphism, then this homeomorphism induces a bijection on the topologies um, of the two spaces. And this gives us another indication of why this definition of homeomorphism makes sense. Essentially what we're trying to do with a homeomorphism is we're saying two spaces are topologically the same if their topologies are just relabelings of each other. So in the same way that we would say that two finite sets are the same if they have a bijection between them, which is essentially just relabeling the points in that set, we say that two topologies are the same if, well, we can just relabel the open sets and get the open sets in the, in the topology of the other space. So if we want a homeomorphism conceptually to be a bijection between the topologies on two spaces, then this proposition is saying that this is achieved if we have a bijective continuous function between those spaces that has a continuous inverse. Now that you hopefully have some feel for what a homeomorphism is in the abstract, let's turn to some concrete examples to see what really matters for homeomorphisms and what doesn't. Our first example states that any two open balls in Rn are homeomorphic. 
I'm just gonna look at the case where n is equal to two, so I can actually draw this stuff, but you can use exactly the same functions that I'm gonna define uh, in Rn with a more general n as well. So let's suppose that we are given the plane R2, and we have some open ball, let's say here, and maybe we're also given a second one down here. And now the claim is that these two are homeomorphic to one another. So by definition, we have to find some continuous function that transforms, let's say, the blue ball into the green one that also has a continuous inverse. How do we do this? Well, we split up the process into two steps. In the first step, we translate uh, the blue ball such that the center of the blue ball is now the center point of the green ball. So the blue ball, which I'll draw in a lighter shade, so we have this translation, and the image of the blue ball now under this translation sits within the green ball, and it's centered. Then in the second step, we can uh, make the blue ball larger so that it has the same size as the green ball. This I'll draw with these little pink arrows. This is a, a dilation. And then you can see that, well, the image under this dilation will be exactly the green ball. So let's call this translation T and this dilation D. And we can write down these functions in terms of formulas. So in the case of the translation, it just takes some x and maps it to x plus some uh, vector a. And in our case, this uh, vector a is just the red vector. And also for the dilation, we map x to cx, where c is some uh, scalar. So C is some scalar. So that means we're just stretching uh, or shrinking the space. Now, because we're dealing with functions uh, of Euclidean space, we can just apply our usual criteria for continuity. And so in this case, both of these functions are, well, they're just polynomials, which means that they're in particular continuous. So we know that these are continuous. Moreover, they're also bijective. Why is this? Well, we can define T inverse, which just maps X to X minus A. And it's clear that if we first do T and then T inverse, well, we're just adding A and then subtracting A again, we end up where we started. And conversely, if we do T inverse first, so we first subtract A and then add A, we also end up where we started. So T inverse is indeed an inverse function to T. And similarly, we can define D inverse to be the function that maps X to one over C X. And here I notice that we shouldn't allow C to be an arbitrary real number because C is not allowed to be zero. If C were zero, then after this would collapse the entire space to the point zero and D would no longer be bijective. So in fact, we want C to be non-zero. And in this case, the inverse function I've written down makes sense because one over C is defined. And it's easy to see that if we first do D and then D inverse, well, first we're multiplying by C and then we're dividing by C, that's one. So we end up where we started. And similarly, if we first divide by C and then multiply by C, we also end up where we started. So D inverse is in fact an inverse to D. And finally, these functions for the same reasons as above, where we're looking at Euclidean space and these are just polynomials, so these are also continuous. Therefore, we've found, well, functions which are continuous have an inverse function, which is also continuous. So T and D are both homeomorphisms. So T and D are homeomorphisms. And this implies that also, if we do first T and then do D, this is also a homeomorphism. This is something we didn't explicitly prove, but if you have two homeomorphisms, 
their composite is also a homeomorphism. This is something you can easily check. But d after t, so if we first translate and then do the dilation, this exactly transforms our blue open ball into the green one, and we've now shown that this transformation is a homeomorphism, which means that the blue open ball is homeomorphic to the green open ball. Now, in fact, this same uh, argument with exactly the same functions works for an arbitrary dimensional Euclidean space because we just need to add some, uh, so a here in this case is in Rn. In our case, it was a vector in R2, but we just add an arbitrary vector and the dilation function doesn't change. So this shows that any two open balls in Rn are homeomorphic. And in particular, size is not a topological property. So we say that a property is topological if it is preserved by homeomorphism. So if homeomorphic spaces share this property or not. But we see here that we have this small uh, open ball and we have a larger open ball and they're homeomorphic. So the size um, or like the radius of the open ball is not something that's preserved by the homeomorphism and hence is not a topological property. So from the point of view of topology, um, these two balls are essentially the same even though if we look at them in terms of the metric on Rn, they would have different sizes. In fact, we can um, see an even more extreme example of this. Namely, if we consider the unit ball and the entire space Rn. And the next example claims that these two things are homeomorphic. So I'll again sketch this in R2. So we have our coordinate system and then we have a unit ball, so this is one and one, and it's open. And we're saying that this unit ball is homeomorphic to the entire space Rn. So in our notation, this is B2, and we claim that this is homeomorphic to R2. This is kind of similar to what we did in the case where we had two balls that were homeomorphic. However, here we already have the, the centers of the spaces aligning, so we just need to do some stretching. However, in this case, uh, the stretching can't be uniform because if we just take some constant factor, then it'll just stretch a point which say has radius A to a point that has radius CA. So we'll never fill the entire uh, space. Therefore, what we have to do is we have to actually increase the amount we stretch or blow up this space in proportion to how close we are to the unit circle. So basically, if I am in some radius which isn't that close to the outside, so the unit circle, then I'm not going to stretch that much. But the closer I get to uh, the edge, which isn't part of the open ball, but uh, the closer I get to what would be the edge of the, of the ball, the more I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch. So formally, we're going to define a function which goes from B2 to R2, and what does it do? It maps x to x over 1 minus the norm of x. So this is the Euclidean norm. In the case of R2, this would just be the square root of the first coordinate squared plus the second coordinate squared. Before going on, let's make sure that this definition even makes sense. The Euclidean uh, norm of some point is just its radius in the plane and because we're always inside the open ball we'll always have some radius that is strictly less than one which means that this denominator here is always going to be strictly greater than zero. Therefore we can divide by this always strictly positive number and our function makes sense. Now let's think about what happens when we approach what would be the boundary uh, of this uh, ball. So if we have a radius that gets closer and closer to one, then the denominator will always get closer and closer to zero. And because we're dividing by it, it means that our value for x will get really, really big. This is what I was saying before. The closer we get to, uh, well, radius one, the larger the factor I'm, uh, is gonna be by which I'm dilating. 
All right, so we have this function, and because we're again talking about Euclidean space, we can apply the usual criteria for continuity, and uh, this function is just, well, it's a continuous function divided by another continuous function, so it's again continuous. So we have f is continuous. Now to show that it's a homeomorphism, we need to find an inverse for f that is also continuous. And the inverse for f is given by the following function, g, which goes from r2 to uh, b2, and it takes a y to y divided by 1 plus the norm of y. This is, again, the Euclidean norm. In this case, uh, it's clear that this function makes sense because we'll never have the case where the denominator is 0, since this thing here is always going to be greater or equal than zero, so if we add it to one, uh, this is always going to be greater or equal to one. Moreover, g is, well, a composite of continuous functions, so it's itself also continuous. Now the only thing we'd have to check is that g is in fact an inverse for f. This is not something I'm going to do because it's kind of an annoying computation. You can try it for yourself. But instead, I'll just try to uh, make it plausible that, in fact, uh, f is a bijective function. So being bijective is the same thing as being injective and surjective. So we can just kind of uh, intuitively check both of those properties for f, and then I'm going to call it a day. So uh, let's suppose that we have two points in uh, the unit ball that are distinct. So let's say we have these two points, and they're distinct. Well, then the image of these points under f is going to lie on the line that extends out through each one of those points from the origin. This is because we're just scaling the vector in R2 by some factor. And so it's just going to scale, it's not going to change its direction. Now, if these two points were initially distinct, then the rays that are induced by these points uh, will not intersect anywhere outside of the origin. In particular, this means that the images of these points under f, which lie somewhere on these two rays, will be distinct, and this shows that f is injective. Let's now consider surjectivity. So if we're given some arbitrary point in R2, let's say this blue one, then we have to find a point in the unit ball which is mapped to it under f. Now we use a similar reasoning, so we draw the ray that goes to this point, and now we know that the, the point in the unit ball that maps to the blue point has to lie somewhere on this ray. Now the only question is uh, where it's going to lie on it in the unit circle. So really, we can just look at the restriction of this function to this line, and so it's actually kind of a one-dimensional problem where we have uh, the origin and then at some point we have one and now we have uh, the blue point which lies somewhere uh, further along the line. Now let's identify this line with the real numbers and say that the blue point has some distance d from the origin. So now we're looking for some point a between uh, 0 and 1, such that a divided by 1 minus the absolute value of a is equal to d. But now in our projection, so in our restricted picture, a is always going to be positive, so the absolute value of a is just a. And now we can rewrite this equation that a is equal to d minus d times a. Now bring the uh, dA to the other side and extract a. So we get a1 plus d equals d. And this implies that a has to be d divided by 1 plus d. And this is exactly the formula we have for g if we, well, neglect uh, the fact that we're in two dimensions and uh, the orientation and so on. In any case, if we restrict to this line, then there is some point a, namely given by d divided by 1 plus d. And in fact, d divided by 1 plus d is um, 
always going to be between 0 and 1, and it's never going to be exactly 1 because the denominator is always slightly bigger than the numerator. Hence, this is a valid point, and it maps to d, and therefore this function f is surjective. So in summary, f is bijective. All right, so we've shown that the unit ball, at least in two dimensions, is homeomorphic to Rn. Now, more generally, these formulas that I have uh, for f and g, they'll also hold if we replace everywhere 2 by a more general n. So instead of 2, we could have n everywhere, and then we'd have to replace the, the, the Euclidean norm in two dimensions by the one in n dimensions. And these formula will still produce the desired result, and so this also holds more generally. In fact, even the argument I used for showing that f is injective and surjective with these rays uh, also generalizes to n dimensions. If you're seeing this for the first time, this might be surprising that like a unit ball, which is a bounded set in Rn, would be homeomorphic to the entire space. So essentially this is kind of saying that the unit ball is like a microcosm for the entire space. So you don't necessarily have to think of Rn as being infinite, you can just think of it being like bounded but open. In particular, boundedness is not a topological property. So we can have spaces that are infinite in extent that are homeomorphic to spaces that are bounded somehow. As a last example, we'll look at two spaces that are homeomorphic, but that have different uh, geometries. In this case, we're looking at the cube versus the sphere in three dimensions. I'll make a picture. The cube looks like this. And in terms of formulas, we can, so this is the set C, we can describe it as all the points x, y, z, um, whose maximum of the absolute value of each individual component is equal to 1. In fact, this expression here with the maximum, this is actually just uh, what's sometimes called the maximum norm in uh, Rn, or in R3 in this case. Then we also have the two-sphere, so that's just the normal surface of a sphere in three dimensions, which I'll draw inside this cube. So you should think about both of these being centered at the origin, and we have the sphere being inscribed inside this cube. So the green set is S2. Now the claim is that these two spaces are homeomorphic. In order to show this, we have to come up with some way of transforming one of the spaces into the other using a continuous map whose inverse is also continuous. Intuitively, you can think of the sphere as being a balloon inside a cube, which is maybe like a, a transparent box. And now what you do is you just inflate uh, the balloon more and more until it fills out the box. So what we're doing is we're sort of inflating, inflating this green sphere until it uh, has the shape of this box that's surrounding it. And this map is the map we're interested in for our homeomorphism. So in terms of a formula, we can write this pink map, uh, which I'll, I guess I'll call F. So the pink transformation is F. This is given by well, the vector x, y, z, divided by the maximum of the points. So essentially, we're just renormalizing every point on the sphere um, so that it lies on this cube. Thus, another way of thinking about this map F would be to take some point uh, on the sphere and then draw a ray that emanates from the origin and then look at the point where this ray intersects the cube. Now, again, by our knowledge of functions on Euclidean space, this F is continuous. This is just because the maximum function is continuous and also dividing by uh, some continuous function, as long as it's not zero, is continuous. 
it also has an inverse, which is given by renormalizing the vector uh, by the norm that gives us uh, the unit sphere. So it's just uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared square root. This, by our knowledge of Euclidean space, is also a continuous function. And in fact, it's an inverse to f. And pictorially, we're do doing exactly the opposite we did. We, we take some point, which is located on the cube. So say this, this uh, red point here, and then we draw the ray that connects to the origin, and then we look where that intersects the sphere. I suggest that you think about why that the, the image of f actually lies on the cube and why the image of g actually lies on the sphere. And you can also think about why these functions are inverse to one another. So this involves uh, explicitly computing both of the composites. So if you do f after g, this should be equal to the identity map on the cube. And if you do g after f, it should be equal to the identity map on the sphere. What's important for our purposes here is that the shape in terms of like if it's a cube or a sphere is not a topological property. So I'm going to say explicitly corners are not a topological property. But it could be more general than just corners. It's like the, the shape of the space in terms of exactly what the geometry looks like is not necessarily a topological property. So in a more general sense, shape is, of course, a topological property. Like both of these spaces are hollow shells. And that's the reason we can transform them into one another by a homeomorphism. But it doesn't really matter exactly how the shape is realized in terms of geometry. So maybe as an easier example, if we just think of this segment here, this is homeomorphic to the segment that has this point like that. These things are, of course, distinct geometrically, so they're not congruent or anything, but topologically, they're the same. Okay, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say about homeomorphisms. So I think, especially regarding these examples here, this might be a bit uh, surprising if you see it for the first time, that from the view of topology, a lot of things which are probably very distinct in your mind, for example, like the, the unit ball and the entire space Rn, they're, they seem very different if you're coming from like an analysis standpoint where boundedness is super important. So it seems like topology is identifying a lot of things. And in the beginning, this can be a bit confusing because certain things that you might be taking uh, to differentiate uh, different spaces in your mind aren't actually uh, different topologically speaking. But I hope that the first part of this video where we looked at uh, homeomorphisms abstractly uh, convinced you that the definition of a homeomorphism we gave is actually the right one because it induces the bijection between the topologies of two spaces. So this should also give you an idea of what we can capture uh, with the notion of a topology. So for example, we can't capture whether a thing is a cube or a sphere, but we can capture, for example, if we're talking about just the outer shell of the sphere or if we're talking about a filled in ball. So th those two things are topologically distinct. Um, we can also capture the difference between this half open interval we saw and, and the unit circle. So those two things are also topologically distinct. Thus topology really describes the, a more general notion of shape, which takes the global configuration of the space into account. So we can distinguish between a line and a circle, but we can't necessarily distinguish between a straight line and a, a jagged line. As you can see from these examples of homeomorphisms, it tends to be kind of tedious to write down explicitly um, a homeomorphism and actually check that the functions are continuous and inverse to one another. So whenever possible, we try to use more abstract properties to show that certain maps are homeomorphisms. And these types of properties are exactly what we'll be looking at in the next video.